Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar entitled Delivering an Active Travel Strategy. Uh, I'm Marshall Poulton, I'm Head of Transport Strategy in Glasgow City Council, and uh, we've got a really wide range of speakers for you this afternoon across the whole of the active travel sector, and I'm sure it'll be an interesting debate. Um, by, by way of domestics, I would ask you to post any questions you may have into the question box. And after the first two speakers, uh, we'll have a short Q&A session. Then we'll move on to our, our last three speakers, followed by another Q&A session. So I'm aiming to have this webinar concluded by 3.45 p.m. This, this afternoon. And um, this is the, the speakers that, that we have, and I'll introduce them in a bit more detail uh, later on. Uh, however, we've got Councillor Anna Richardson, John Dales, Rose MacArthur, Robin Tucker, and Duncan Dollimore speaking to you today. Um, before I invite Councillor Richardson to speak, I'd like to stress that this afternoon it's not all about Glasgow and Glasgow City Council, but more an opportunity to learn from best practice in active travel. So with that said, I would now like to introduce Councillor Anna Richardson. Uh, Anna graduated with an MA Honours in Geography, then gained an MSc in Human Resources. After spending several years working in the public sector, she then became a councillor in Langside in Glasgow in 2015, and then was re-elected in 2017. She currently holds the position of City Convener for Sustainability and carbon reduction in Glasgow City Council. And certainly from personal experience, I know that Councillor Richardson is very dynamic and passionate about active travel. And she's given ourselves, my teams, the political drive in getting to the current position. So with that, Anna, uh, over, over to you. Thank you very much, Marshall, for that introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be here as we launch this consultation today. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the work that has gone into getting us to this stage by a small but incredibly dedicated team during what has been, for all of us, a very challenging time. Since the publication of the Council's Strategic Plan for Cycling in 2016, we have seen a huge amount of change, both in terms of our climate ambitions and our acknowledgement of the key role that active travel has to play in our transport network. I think that's reflected in the step change that this strategy now offers. The new strategy had a big job to do. It was to determine what would be required to achieve a real network accessible to all by 2030. I believe that the team have risen to that challenge and that that ambition runs through every page of this document. So today I briefly want to draw attention to some of the underlying themes in this strategy that I believe make it potentially transformational for Glasgow. First of all, it's a strategy built around addressing inequality. We know that we can improve lives by enabling more transport options, in particular within communities that have been disconnected from work, education and other opportunities. Active travel is cheap and it's good for health as well as being an efficient mode of transport. And we have relatively low car ownership in our city, though this is unevenly distributed. We need to ensure that car-free living is a positive choice and one that doesn't detrimentally impact on the independence and mobility of our citizens. And it's time that we reallocate our road space in fairer ways that reflect the inequality of giving so much space over to cars when many sections of our communities cannot benefit and indeed may be actively harmed by the status quo. We also identify public transport as a key part of our transport network. So we've included actions that will improve access to bus stops and train stations too. It's absolutely crucial that sustainable modes of transport work together, not against one another. And walking and wheeling already form part of so many everyday journeys, but there's potential for that to be even greater when we remove the barriers to those journeys. These routes need to be and to feel safe. So we'll work on pavement clutter, dropped curbs, improved pedestrian crossings, and avoid shared space wherever possible so that our streets feel welcoming to all. And when it comes to cycle infrastructure, we'll work with stakeholders to make these designs as inclusive as possible, both for non-standard cycles and for the other people who may interact with the cycle lanes, such as pedestrians when they're wishing to cross. 
street design will always throw up conflicts and require compromise. So let's get this right, because then we all benefit from streets that work for every part of our community. The babies and buggies and the children on scooters, as well as our elderly and disabled people. And when we talk about infrastructure being accessible for all, we must also focus on groups who may feel more vulnerable, not only from traffic, but from other threats. We've been very clear that our city network will be an on-road only network, and we refer to the importance of lighting and passive surveillance. I won't be the only one here today who makes choices every day during the winter months on whether it feels safer to cycle among busy traffic or through a quiet green space. But I'm pretty certain that the women among us feel this even more keenly. By building the city network, we'll no longer have to weigh up those risks. We'll simply be able to ride home. Parks, green spaces and our canals are vital and valued resources, and we will of course continue to link them to the network. But they're not on their own a transport network that we can all make use of equally. This is feminist city building. So I've already made reference to the city network, but as it's such a key aspect of the strategy, let me highlight it once again. We're proposing approximately 270 kilometres of cycle lanes to be in place by 2030. If we're to create significant modal shift and the decarbonisation of our transport system in under a decade, then nothing less than that will do. And we have many ambitious projects already in construction or in the pipeline that contribute to this network, as well as bringing significant public realm improvements. These range across the city from Woodside to the avenues, from the East City Way to York Hill and Kelvin Grove. But we now need to address how we pick up the pace to deliver a large number of additional kilometres of network every single year. The revolution in project delivery that occurred during the pandemic has shown us what is possible. Spaces for people certainly wasn't perfect, and indeed I never want to roll out major changes without any consultation again. But it achieved incredible things under the conditions, and that so much of that will now become permanent is testament to that achievement from our team. The pandemic's legacy on our roads may now be Spaces for People Plus, an approach that will take the best of the speedy rollout, but done in a more coordinated and considered way. Let's not forget that as life becomes a little more normal again, we must work with the determination that the climate emergency demands of us. There will be challenges and hurdles ahead, but I know that we're now ready to take that on. There is far more in this strategy across the many themes than I can touch on today. I look forward to seeing the results of the consultation and where we can strengthen this document even further. In the action plan, I see reflected back the solutions to so many of the barriers and frustrations that I've experienced myself, as well as in countless conversations and emails with Glaswegians that I've engaged with in my four years so far in this role. I hope many of you also feel seen and listened to as you read through the strategy. So let us know what you think and then join us in delivering this active travel transformation for Glasgow. Thank you. Hannah, thanks very much for that. That was that was excellent. <clears throat> and I think that might be one of the themes uh, this afternoon um, about the reallocation of, of road space. Uh, totally agree with what you say. And that was that was backed up last year with the public conversation that we had that there was something in the order of 81% of the respondents want reallocation um, of the, the road space. The public are very much in favour of that. And I think it was something in the region of 77% of the respondents uh, supported people in place uh, being prioritised in the city centre. And obviously, Councillor Richardson has taken that on board and fed uh, this, this information and direction back to um, to our, our teams. So thanks very much, uh, Anna, for, for that. And uh, could I maybe invite John Dales now? Um, John is a traffic engineer and uh, also a transport planner and very much an urban designer with over 30 years professional experience. And that spans across uh, all strategic transport planning to concept design. Uh, design. Um, John's got considerable experience of working closely with local authorities and other stakeholders. And uh, just to show the breadth of John's experience, 
It covers projects as diverse as the concept design of complex streets and spaces in Glasgow City Centre, various London centres, the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, central Newcastle, and more recently in Birmingham. So, uh, John, I hope you're there and it's over to you. Thanks, yeah, I just couldn't uh, start with my coffee. I suddenly realised I'd made something. I thought I might as well have it on hand just in case. Um, good afternoon. Uh, as Marshall said, I'm John from Urban Movement. We design streets and um, it's what we love to do. And they are complex and awkward and full of people. We let anybody use them. And that's one of the beauties of streets and also one of the challenges. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do and what we're talking about this afternoon, of course, is how we can enable uh, more people to use them in different ways ways that are necessary uh, in terms of societal goals that we've got and in, in terms of addressing the crises we've got. Um, it's a challenge, of course, and uh, but it's wonderful to know that Glasgow, amongst other cities, as Marshall mentioned earlier, is really trying to take the ball by the horns and to move on with this. So um, I start with a picture from Glasgow, and it's um, this, and um, it's a photograph I actually took, um, and I, I just, it's sunny and it's in Glasgow, it's, but it actually happened. And um, what I love about this is this uh, a new street that we were involved in the design of. It shows somebody walking and looking at their phone, but not in any danger of walking out into traffic. Uh, we, we, it's a, a new cycle track that is fit for a young man to be taught how to cycle with his mum there on the left, still with his stabilizers, but it's also good enough for a, um, a food delivery guy to use as well. It's a street that now has trees, which there are very few of in central uh, Glasgow, which of course gives you protection from the sun, which is burning down so much of the time. Uh, in that same strip as the trees, uh, there are cycle racks there. There are new benches. You can see those three friends uh, just there. And there's basically more space for active travel and less for inactive travel. <clears throat> Although, as you can see, the number 18 just about to turn in there, there is plenty of space for the buses to run and also for the necessary activity uh, associated with the, that involves vehicles associated with the buildings alongside. And in a way, what this is, a, is, is an image of rebalancing the street in the way that is a street, a street in the way that's necessary for us to do on many, if not most streets if we're to meet our various uh, climate and uh, other change objectives and what the active travel strategy is seeking to achieve generally, of course. Sadly, if you can just quickly go to the next picture, I literally got this photograph yesterday. And I don't want to start with a sour note, but I did decided that I didn't want to finish with one either. This is on that same street, it's just popped up. Uh, there is a zone to the right specifically created for street furniture, whether or not we obviously there's a that whether or not this BT facility needs to be in the street at all is a, somebody else's argument. But if it's going to be on this street at all, it needs to be three or five, sorry, five meters to the right of that photograph, not blocking the footway that was specifically widened, not damaging the case and stone that was put down at, at some cost. And I suppose this is just for me an example of, of, of the kind of things we need to consider when we're dealing with active travel. This is just in somebody's walking way, potentially in a cycling way, because of the, the way that we make decisions. And this is one level at which we're, we're talking about decision making for streets, but it shows that we have to work. It's just a reminder that we need to work um, in, in so many different ways. If we're to, and we need to be on our guard and we need as, as something I'll touch on in a moment to be making sure that all our efforts are joined up across all council and partner um, initiatives in order to make sure that we are everything we do adds value to everything we just did rather than as in this case detracts from it. Next slide please. Um, what I've done here is just quickly taken one of the graphics out of what I think I, I'm bound to say but it's also what I believe is an excellent strategy um is this particular what i've highlighted there is that the fact of there having been a public conversation on transport in glasgow and i already mentioned the problems that can come and this is something i want to, to touch on again the problems that can come when we don't consult but also there are ways in which we in ways of consulting as well uh, we can be from information through to genuine engagement and participation 
and and I hope that the opportunity is taken as part of the engagement on this strategy that there will really be a rich conversation that will continue and it's not just for the sake of having a conversation if I might say I don't think it's just for the sake of making sure our design work and our schemes are configured with the input as they should be of local people and end users it's more because the process of engagement <clears throat> I think is vital in continuing continuing starting and continuing to roll out the message and a public understanding of the fact that change like this is necessary it's not some high, from on high initiative to achieve some goals that might seem remote to most people <clears throat> it, it is it's something that's much more important it's about your life and, and mine and I think the importance of taking this discussion out into the public domain and keeping it there and keeping it up front and centre is so important because ultimately when we're talking, it's very easy to think of these in almost an abstract. We know that there are political and, and other challenges, but actually it's very easy to think that we've got an active travel strategy and it's the right strategy. and We hope we get it past people and, and, and you know, hope, hope it gets endorsed and, and, and is then implemented. But every step of the way, what we're really, the council can only do so much. I think the, the strategy says that. I think Anna just said it. And, and what we, you know, we need to work with partners, but actually every individual in the city needs to be on board for this. <clears throat> and to be perfectly frank, one of the issues we face is that even people who would describe themselves as being um, in, in worried about the environment, which is the vast majority of people, what they struggle with, what we all struggle with, is the fact that we are going to have to change how we live. This isn't just a matter of, sort of just putting on, as it were, cycling or just putting on a bit more walking, a little something we can do quite easily. It's not just a matter of switching off your telly. It's not just a matter of having eco-friendly walking, uh, a washing powder. This is a matter of how we live our lives. So many of us have used to just get out, those who have cars, just get out, get into the car. It's what we do. It's why we bought it. And, and oh, addressing this in every way that we go for. So this is not the council pointing figures. Nobody ever changed their, their, their mind at the point of a finger. It, it, it mustn't seem like that. It mustn't seem like a, a strategy for we know better than you, we're going to do this. Um, that's not how it can be. And I think the consultation and the conversation the council has already started and what the conversations that will happen around this strategy are so important in the long term, beyond, as it were, the, 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 the adoption of this strategy, as it were, as obviously hope will happen, and, and indeed beyond the, the implementation of specific initiatives that it has within it. Uh, next slide, please. We're going to have to rattle through so many of these. And, and just quickly looking at those three themes, um, I, I think if we, if you like, the first one is about doing stuff, the physical infrastructure. The second one is about um, encouraging and enabling and training people. And the third one is about um, further information as we're encouraging, motivating change. And I think it's that third one that in, in many respects could be the most important. I know that, that the many people on this call and myself included, we need the infrastructure, we need the physical stuff. But in fact, what we will find is that it's easier to build that stuff, easier to get consent, even if we know what to do, that uh, democratic authorities need as much consent as possible with what they're doing. And you will have more of that, I think, if we're working much harder in terms of the encouraging, what I call them motivating and sustaining change. That sustaining is so important, but it starts with the public acceptance, increasing public success, acceptance of the need to change and of the fact that they can change one step, then another one pedal stroke you might say next slide please actually if you can just crash through the next four these are just yeah go keep going these are details for all of those four steps and i think uh, i urge you to have a look at the, the different themes that they're that are in here but it's it's they're all part of the theme so the fact that those three themes are there is great the infrastructure the training and the uh as it were the public conversation the enabling I just picked on these uh, little bits here about that promotion and messaging. And so I've already touched upon, I think there's a real issue in, in so much of this is that we have, and quite rightly in the past, enough of training, enough of encouraging. We need to enable. And in order to enable people, we have to do the infrastructure. We, you know, people cannot be encouraged to cycle with a dotted white line alongside a 38 tonner with their kids. And yet, um, there's a danger that we actually think it's all about delivering infrastructure and this. Well, of course, in many respects it is, but it's also about the uptake of that infrastructure and about, as I've said, the consent 
to get that. And I think um, this 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 aspect of it, the promoting and messaging, the messaging almost more than the other thing, which is this idea that um, it says here, develop targeted campaigns to Glasgow's diverse communities. And also you can see there that this idea of council leading by example, the messages surrounding active travel cannot be restricted just to our transport endeavors. They must be part of a council life. So every message you get, whether it's about housing or about regeneration or about education, that we're making sure that these messages are common themes to all of that, because this is about global objectives that the council has, not just about climate change, isn't just about transport, it's about so much more about how we live our lives. And the, the connectedness of these messages, I think is important. If I might go back for a moment to that BT thing popping up on Sohill Street, that's just an example of the fact that our wires have got crossed or, or rather that, they, that various synapses haven't joined up yet. Really important to do that. Next slide. So, uh, as Marshall's already said, we're not just talking about what's happening in Glasgow. And actually, what's great is that is that other cities are doing this at the moment. You, you might be aware that Birmingham is right on the front foot in these to, to, in these sorts of things. And in fact, it's just that little way ahead <coughs> of Glasgow because although you can see that this transport plan was uh, first published in draft in January 2020, they have now had their public conversations or the beginnings of their public consultation. And this very evening, as you'll see later, uh, this uh, the, the the plan is going before uh, the cabinet in order to be signed off for action. Uh, that's Councillor Wasim uh, uh, Zafar on the right, and he's kind of Anna's counterpart. And uh, it's, it's great to see these individuals making so much of an effort and being so committed, local people who have completely different backgrounds and who you wouldn't necessarily, this guy himself says, you know, I was, he's a petrol head. That's where he comes from. His dad was a taxi driver. But, but we're thinking about it in the role he's in, he's suddenly realized it, or rather he's become to realize how important active travel is and, um, and is promoting it uh, as, as, as with all his might, really. Next slide. Um, and just quickly, and uh, uh, just, if I can just show that uh, we're doing some work, we've been doing some work up in Birmingham, this actually just over the border into Sandwell, but actually it's all part of the scheme we were doing on the Birmingham to, in the Smethwick to Birmingham corridor. And one of the things that really struck me, it was interesting talking with colleagues from the councils about this when I walk around, I went and had a long walk around of my own in, in, earlier this year in March. And just my perspective from walking around, not cycling, walking around was just, when it comes to the end of it, I thought, do you know, that one of the things that's really important to recognize when we're talking about increasing active travel with things how they are um, uh, on the on the left there a metro station you don't even know is there and you're just a few yards away from it the other side of that bridge far too wide a junction to cross to get to it uh, that bellmouth there footways you can't walk on because of uh, parked cars next slide please um, uh, signalized junctions even big ones that you have to dash across because you don't have a green man um, and stuff that's just plonked in the way, if you like, on that top right there, it's a little bit like that, that BT box. Yeah, we did a thing, it just, but it's, it stops access uh, to that thing, especially if you're a wheeling or in a wheelchair, extremely awkward, and then just footways that don't exist. And what are my conclusions from that? And it's easy to do, and it was, I, I, I think colleagues found it quite helpful, at least they said they did, was that actually just to have that fresh pair of eyes because the simple fact is in this part of Birmingham, if you have an option for a journey that's more than around about 200 yards, if you can avoid walking, you will. It's so miserable. And that's, that's a huge gap. You know, if, you, if you've got a car, you'll do it because you can't walk down some footways. Goodness knows how you wheel down some of these areas. They are just kind of no-go areas in a very ordinary sort of dreadful way. And, and it's and just as I suppose just some photographs next slide please that it sh that show what the challenge is for this vision that the Birmingham's got. You can look it up uh, yourselves, of course, Birmingham local plan. And so I won't local uh, sorry transport plan, and I won't um, trouble you through it uh, through go through any of the detail except it's very similar in terms of uh, what it's trying to achieve the vision in the same way that uh, Glasgow's active travel and other related strategies are. Next slide, please. It has the four big moves, which is which is great. It hasn't got three and there are different kinds of moves to Glasgow's and it just goes to show that we're not copy pasting. It's, we're just thinking about it differently. Reallocating road space, transforming the city centre. Um, looking especially at active travel and local neighbourhoods, I'll come on to that um, in, in the short time and remain to me in terms of short journeys that, and what we can do with those and then managing demand through parking measures. Always an interesting challenge. Next slide, please. 
as part of their conversation what they've done is right so what do you think about all of these and actually which is great when you have these conversations and i hope um well actually i hope it could be even better in glasgow but i suspect it'd be similar which is you get what are called these sort of smile curves which is you get a lot of people agreeing and and and, and, and the next biggest number of disagreeing and actually sometimes the disagreeing might be greater than the others but that often happens but what's great here is actually for all of those themes, although there was opposition in most in the terms of parking measures, surprise, surprise, um, uh, the, 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 the strongly agree or rather the agree that were supportive in every single measure. And this is the kind of information you, you, you need to have, of course, not just so you know, but so you can play it back in future conversations. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a just a little diagram which comes back to the work they're proposing in the city centre, which is almost the kind of the poster child of this work. It's certainly the, as you'll see from my next slide, the, um, the, um, uh, the, the thing that's grabbed the headlines and this idea in the city centre to make it a series of low traffic neighbourhoods, essentially. So you cannot, you will not be able to drive through the city centre at all, just in and out. And uh, that's a, a huge challenge for remote the city, but it's necessary. It's necessary. Yes, you can come in, you can access everything, but you can't go through and out the other side. And I think in terms of this article that was written by Carlton Reed in, in interviewing councillors afar, I think the thing I've highlighted in red here is the crunch. And obviously Anna knows a lot about this. And, and this comes back to my, my point about messaging, I think, which is although you don't come into politics to, to win popularity contexts, but to change lives for the better, that's absolutely where Anna's coming from in this and, it, and it's certainly where our scene comes from and many others as well. Nevertheless, if we're to do this because we have colleagues, uh, we have to get re-elected and all this sort of thing. It's important that we uh, have, as it were, the convictions to not cave in to, to, to noisiness, but actually that we have the information and are working to develop the information, uh, knowledge about how people feel so that that smile curve is going to be more agreeing and fewer disagreeing over time and we know that will happen in any case once thing happened that's the evidence that, that we find in all these schemes that opposition tends to fade because people find it wasn't that bad and actually it was quite good um, but you need that conviction and it's great to see that so far uh, uh, Wasim has that in the same way that Anna does really important that we have these leaders next slide please and just to say as I just to quickly to show that that's look at the date on that that is tonight a nice coincidence that uh, that the plan to do this so as i say just a few months ahead of glasgow uh, their strategy which is a, obviously a, a broader transport plan but has many of the same um, objectives as uh, glasgow's does is going to get signed off tonight and off they go and all power to them next slide please <clears throat> of course it's not just uh, birmingham and it's not just glasgow I mean, leeds are doing something very similar I'm, uh, on, a, on a panel they're helping them support them um, building forward their transport strategy. And next slide, please. The thing I kind of love about this, I, I love this vision and it's it's done well. It's, it's our, our vision is for Leeds to be a city where you don't need a car. That's done well. It's not about being car free. It's not about, but you won't need a car. And they're looking very much, you can see their themes along the bottom as well, um, but they're looking very much at this idea of how do we enable that to be true? Because of course, people will look at that and many people thinking, well, that's, that's pie in the sky. I, I will need a car, but it's 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 presenting a vision rather than rather than giving any sense that you're kind of wrong or bad or you've made some errors of judgment if you do drive. And I think that's a fantastic vision to have. Next slide, please. And just going back to what I've always said, if you just you don't have to look at this in, in detail, of course, but if you just look at the green uh, panels here, this is about the process that they have had. So they've had their they've had a big conversation several years ago, in fact, started in 2016, 2017. Um, and that's been ongoing through an initiative called Connecting Leads, which is their banner for all of this. Um, but that's the one at the top, that consultation and engagement. Actually, to be honest, the original conversation happened before this slide. They have had some more conversation, which is the topmost of those three green things. And there's a lot more green things coming. And I think, again, it's not just about consultation and engagement and my advice has been to them. It's that idea about is about how you uh, bring people along with you not just about the scheme or the strategy itself but about the need for this and again how does that uh, come across all corporate messaging whether that is about uh, retail education uh, employment or whatever it might be next slide please 
And just finally, it's just in terms of this, it just it happens to be a document that, that 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 we put together with London Cycling Campaign, which you can download just by googling the title, "How to Talk to People About the Future of Their Streets." Um, I think the key thing for me in this is that is is that we need to talk to people about this. This is not just about this scheme, but actually the whys, the wherefores. Why would you get on board? Uh, I urge you to download and have a look at that. It, it was it was it was actually in preparation just before the pandemic, and there are some notes you'll see in it that that bring it slightly up to date. I'm glad to to say that actually, after all the challenges that Anna sort of uh, tangentially alluded to, that many authorities have had in terms of the reaction to the active travel measures that they were obviously brought in without the consultation we would normally have. I think all the um, uh, the, the messages in here are still sound and whole water. So have a look at that because I think ultimately, next slide please, if we want to um, to deliver better places, we have to engage with people. I just shoved this here, it's just a bunch of data. And one of the key things, um, this is my second last slide that I, that I think are so important, is that it's helpful to explain to people. And if you have this data, use it. If you haven't got it, get it. It's this idea of, you know, so many of our journeys are so short, and I know there's that one you couldn't do, you need your car for on that one, but look at the number of them, look at the number of them. And, and actually for you, you know, everyone where they talk about traffic, what's worse in traffic, other drivers, other traffic, you know, if there's less of it, so your essential journey is easier, then that would be good, wouldn't it? And actually, it's, I think this, the, this sort of data, the amount of driving that's done for really short journeys is the way into this. Um, that the, the, the walking can be seen as a mode of transport more than it is just the thing we do. It actually, because you can walk instead of that. You see what it requires cycling. So many, 66%, this is my borough, Ealing, 66% of all the car trips starting in Ealing uh, could be cycled in 15 to 20 minutes. You know, that's, uh, all right, you, you can't at the moment, you wouldn't think about, there's a huge number of them. Just imagine if you got half of that, and, and so it goes. This is great data. Next slide, please. And so we end up with, if we get this all right, if we keep talking, if we keep committing to building infrastructure, of course, this is a, an infrastructure project we're looking at, we really can change the world. We do have to bring people with us on that. And I think that's not just because we have to, it's because it's good for them if we do. You know, we, we are asking you to change your lives, but actually these will be lives that you will enjoy more. These will be lives that will be more fruitful. Well, these will be lives where you're not spending so much time behind the wheel wishing you weren't there. Um, and uh, I wish, obviously, the, 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 the transport strategy, the active travel strategy, uh, every success in order that we can have more of these in Glasgow and things like these in other cities. Thanks very much. John, that was excellent. Thanks very much for, for that and um, really thought provoking. So, um, it's, uh, if we could maybe have 10 to 15 minutes of questions. Since uh, Anna and John have been speaking, there's been a good number of questions come in to the questions box. I've tried to sort them into some form of, of order um, and, and maybe. The first question to yourself, John. Um, one of the comments coming in is, I have seen many new cycle lanes pop up recently, but they are not segregated. So that leaves them open to abuse and very prone to, to abuse, such as parking and driving on. So the question is, what's being done by local authorities in general on education to drivers and enforcement um yeah it's a it's a very good question it's one you can understand why it, why why it exists i think i would say personally that i think obviously i majored quite a lot in what i was saying just now about the importance of of, of, of getting the message out there uh, that people whatever they're doing whether they're walking cycling or especially when they're driving have got this understanding of we need to change and this is why you would do that I would say I think uh, enforcement is really important um, in terms of uh, certainly in terms of moving by static vehicle uh, enforcement. However, um, if we're depending on that, uh, change will be uh, incredibly slow coming, even if it does at all. And I think 
the key thing about some of the, a lot of the active travel measures, certainly those I've seen in Glasgow and those I've seen in many other cities, the emergency ones that were done, the most successful ones there was where there was some physical separation. And these might just be a planter or a wand or a, or, or a, or a, or a bollard of sorts. But I think the key thing then is, you know, you know, if you're driving that this is a line you shouldn't cross. Even if you've got a mandatory cycle line lane there, a white line, it is just paint and it's easy to cross. And if I'm just popping in for the thing, or that's my hairdressers there, or the ATM is over there, uh, people will do that. And with the best one in the world, although it's obviously out there and Diana knows better than I do, and you do, Marshall, I'm sure for Glasgow, um, you know, it's out there that, that the idea that, oh, the council are making a mint of all this enforcement. It's plain you're not making enough because if you're making that much money, you'd be out there all the time pinging everyone all the time, pinging everyone all the time. I should say that when it comes to enforcement, my view that actually the ideal number of fines, sorry, there's my coffee machine switching off in the background there. I shall just wait for it in a second if you can hear it. I, I would say that the, that the ideal number of fines is zero. What we want is, is, is for these lanes to be respected uh, and, and, and similarly, and for people not to park where they shouldn't. So I, I think enforcement is important, but I think it, enforcement will be much easier if there is also physical protection. And I think one of the things we've learned in the last year and a half is how effective really cheap stuff can be. You can have a much better public highway grab much quicker, much more cheaply. You can get more done quicker if you're losing using light touch measures. Um, and therefore, I would say that, that, that we are, we well, need those. Um, if you're thinking about great resource, fine, but actually you could focus on that till the cows come home and it won't do the trick. You need that as well as some kind of physical protection. Okay, thanks a lot for that, John. Um, Anna, maybe on the same uh, subject matter, safety, and in particular safety for women and girls. Um, do you think that's more about cultural and social changes and what behaviour changes would you like to see being put in place? In terms of my the comments I was making um, in my opening remarks around uh, the impact of our transport network on women, I think it's something that's been um, at the forefront of so much uh, public discussion um, again sadly in recent weeks um, and it feels as though we have a lot of these conversations in very um, reactive ways to the the never-ending tragedies that, that we have um, as a society um, in terms of the active travel strategy one of the things that was really important to me was that we designed a strategy that didn't just have a, a section on equalities or didn't just um, reference them you know towards the end of the document but actually ran these principles right through um, so when we're looking at the city network um, and, and the development of the infrastructure but also through the behavior change sections of the the document we're looking at how are we continually doing everything we can to ensure that this is not only accessible and welcoming um, as as a city for women that want to to do walking cycling and wheeling uh, but how are we proactively trying to um, to almost build in uh, what those groups need in terms of the city network i think having the, the on roads network uh, is absolutely crucial and that's because we don't feel safe um, when we're in places where there aren't other people um, and certainly that is you know what i was alluding to that talking about green space it's wonderful um, and i will always choose to commute through a park um, for half of the year and the other half of the year i, I take my chance with the buses and the trucks because that's what I have to do to, to make my journey feel safe and, and to give myself what feels like the best chance of getting home to my family. And I think that's, you know, completely unacceptable that we have to make those choices. So through this strategy, I think it's about us building um, a city so that um, women, whether they are um, women looking after children um, or whether they're, they're carers uh, looking after people with mobility issues, whether they're elderly women, whether we're um, out on our bikes or walking, that we're creating pavements and we're creating cycle lanes that feel safe um, and accessible and usable for all of us. And I think by doing that, all of us gain uh, because that's the type of street layout that I think works um, across the board for all of us. So that's those were the, the, the comments I was making around women. Um, I think there's obviously a lot more to go on and I could talk at length and I know there'll be many women on the call here who um, don't like the language that is used at them when they're out cycling, when they're out walking. Um, there's a huge uh, societal shift that has to happen to make this uh, a women-friendly um, 
place and I think that is perhaps like with the remit of an active travel strategy but I think it's really important that no matter what policy we're making we always look at it through that feminist lens and we always see what we can do um, through these these policies that we're bringing forward that just make it that little bit better um, and make the contribution that we can uh, towards uh, a fairer safer society and one that's better for women. Okay uh, thanks maybe one last question I would like to put to, to both of you to see what your views are um, can entrenched attitudes and training be changed quickly enough to make the progress that the strategy desires? John, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, yes, I'm very much a glass off full person, I say, say that, but actually I think that's why all three strands of Glasgow's strategy are so important. It's not one, it's not the other. I can understand why in the past we've gone soft on the uh, gone slowly on, the, as it were, on the training, the messaging, because we were doing nothing on the infrastructure. Um, I think, I suppose what I would say is comes back to why I was leading so much, even though I'm somebody who actually, you know, runs a company, we design infrastructure ultimately. What I've realised in the, in the in the last few years is the fact that that job will become much easier if we are, if our messaging is correct, if you're bringing people with us. There's still far too much of it, and this is a time thing, and I really hope it will be less of a time thing. I think it comes touches on something that Anne was just saying as well about, I think the active tra travel strategy hopefully can help in in, in terms of the, 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 the personal safety issues that we've spoken of, just because <laughs> things become more normative, there will be more people around. And, 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 and I think, we need to put, press every button that we possibly can on this. Um, and as I say, it, it, we need people to be choosing to do things differently, not just because we provide infrastructure, because they're thinking their own lives. I can change, I can change, I can do that now. Um, and so I think I wouldn't, in, in many respects, I, 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 in terms of the themes in the active travel strategy, I play all of them as hard as, as, as the other. You need all that, but the, the training is very important as well, because even if people do that, there, there are loads of people I know, and friends of mine, you think, oh, I just, I feel wobbly, you know, that it's at that level. And then other people who just think, oh, I don't have to, I don't need to, why would I? I still just jump in the car because I haven't quite got it yet, the personal message for me. Um, so I think, I think all those three strands are important and, and I'm glad they're all there. Great. Um, Anna, is there anything you want to add to that? Or do you think John's covered at all? No, I think um, I'm pretty glass half full as well. Most people would, would probably say that. And out of the deep darkness that uh, came from the COVID pandemic, I think the one of the very small slivers of silver lining was the change that we saw in the way that we do things. I think nobody that's lived through the last two years now can say that, oh, you know, we, we can't react in a crisis, we can't act in an emergency. And I think, you know, we say it in the active travel strategy, I said it in my remarks, we are moving from a COVID crisis back into the climate crisis, which is even bigger and is going to be even harder. And it's going to be something that requires even more tenacious and, and determined action from all of us. Uh, and so I think everybody, whether within the profession, whether within local authorities, um, all of us showed that when we had to do something, we could do it really fast. We rolled out more kilometres of cycling in that year than we had in the years previously that I was in this role. And I think um, that showed that we can do it. Um, what we just need to, to do now is actually deliver on it um, and continue that level of, of, uh, of commitment and keep that pace up. So I think we can do it. I think it's definitely within our powers. Um, we just need to get, get ahead and do it. That's great. Thanks very much, Anna, for that. Um, apologies for the other questions that have been asked. Um, I would like to move on to the next speaker now. Um, well, if we move on now, uh, the next speaker we have is, is Rose, Rose MacArthur. She's the Director um, of Highways and Transportation at uh, Cheshire West and Chester Council. And um, I know that, that Rose was uh, just until recently technical director Mott McDonald's in the integrated transport business side of the, the house, where she focused on travel demand management and transport planning for major global sporting events. So um, I believe Rose's passion is to create and deliver complex travel, travel demand management programs that will result in proven and sustained travel behaviour change. So, Rose, great to have you all here today and uh, over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Tomato. I was wondering what biog that you were going to read there because I couldn't remember providing one. So apologies. Yeah, yeah, I've got a, I'm three weeks into a new role. 
Um, so for those of you who know me from sort of my travel demand management work, I've, I've moved over to the other side. I'm now uh, in local authority. So Marshall, I think we've probably got a lot to talk about, about how, how we do this um, in Cheshire West and Chester. But um, today I'm here because I want to talk to you about the, the, the other work that I specialise in, in uh, travel demand management. And um, I've got, you know, I've just been listening to John and, 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 and listening to Anna and, and and thinking kind of all about this my my sort of approach to to the presentation today um is very much about the macro level behavior change um it's so interesting to be in uh, the role that i've got now where i'm going to be responsible for rolling out um programs just like uh, the one we're talking about um and and actually sort of seeing it from the from the user side as much as the kind of the council side but actually, my career so far has been actually bringing people to to use the infrastructure that we're talking about, to use those networks that we're talking about. Um, and it, it just makes me laugh at just sort of how big that challenge is. But I'll, I'll come on to why it makes me laugh in a minute. But um, yeah, so a bit tongue in cheek, you know, it's a delivering of the behavior change. Actually, how do you get people to use these networks? How do you get people to engage in it? Um, and really, it's sort of all about how to make friends and influence people. And like I said, the, 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 all of my career so far has been literally spent um, persuading and, and getting people to actually use um, use the mode of travel that we really want them to use. If you just go to the next slide, please. So this, this is um, a really, really interesting slide. And, and obviously, you'll get these after the presentation if you want to sort of pour over it a little bit. Um, apologies that there's um, a small text in here. So I've, I've unashamedly taken this from um, my time at Mott McDonald. And I was sitting through a presentation on climate change and the net zero um, ambition that we have. And, and this came up, and I don't really can see in the top of that graph that 8%, 8% of all um, the, end of the, the, the net zero position, this emission reduction is going to have to come from behavior change materials. But then that massive sort of teal chunk that you've got in the center there, that low carbon technologies, with active involvement of consumers. So again, again related to the behavior change angle um, and, and actually delivering um, a, a change in how we interact. So there's a there's an Aesop's fable and it's called Belling the Cat and it just reminds me of it all the time that when I see slides like this and when we talk about you know this this what we've got to be able to achieve and what we want to achieve together but the, the fable goes that you know there's all these cats in the top of it uh, all these mice in the top of a church and every night a cat comes in and you know picks one of them off and eats it and they have the little mice have a church meeting and they say, oh, you know, what can we do about it? And, and little mouse stands up and says, oh, we can put a bell around the cat's neck. And then the other little mouse says, yeah, but who's going to do it? And it, it just makes me laugh. that everybody's got these great, you know, laudable ambitions as to how we're going to achieve this net zero position from transport. But actually, it's going to come from behavior change as much as anything else. And, and how we're going to do it, you know, it's not an easy task. Um, and so that, that slide really is just to kind of demonstrate that. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, my my sort of specialism, the area of work that I focused on is travel demand management. I don't think it kind of probably makes as much sense today when we're talking about an active travel strategy to talk about it at that macro level. But in essence, it is about travel behavior change. Travel demand management strategies are, in essence, a travel behavior change campaign. And, and some of the kind of like the guiding principles, some of the guiding elements for me that I'm going to go into in a bit more detail and talk to you, talk you through a few um, sort of global case studies of is that you can't be anecdotal or scattergun. You really can't sort of say, oh, it'd be nice if we did that or, or, or yeah, let's try and do that. You've really, really got to be data led. You, you definitely will work best when you've got a catalyst for change or a focus. Now, some of the examples I'm going to give you are, are Glaswegian, the Glasgow Commonwealth Games that um, a lot of you would have been involved with or, or lived through, um, the London Olympics or the DFT's recent um, uh, return to education TDM strategy uh, post-COVID. Uh, so there's always been a sort of big catalyst for change. Without that, you know, what do you need? You do need that focus. So that focus can often be a personal motivator. And so we've talked a lot already um, in the presentations about, you know, what you want to achieve and why you want to achieve it. But you really do have to tailor that back to what that personal motivator is. And, and my these are just my four, the four ones that I, I come back to are time, money, health or carbon. So will it save me time? Will it save me money? Will it make me healthier? Will it reduce my carbon? Now, I, you know, there's people on the call, I'm sure, who will remember the, the green travel plan dates, you know, and then we dropped the green, didn't we? Because it became about congestion mediation and then it became about um, air quality and then it became about 
you know, health and movement and, and balancing inactivity with activity. Um, and, and now we're probably back in that cycle where carbon is that major motivator again, but it, it can be all of those four things. It can be all of them, none of them, one of them. But having that personal motivator behind um, why you're asking someone to do something is important in a behavior change cycle. And when you're doing a really big macro campaign, when you're trying to get people onto this network that you're talking about, it really, it does kind of um, help to have that single source of truth and then an exceptionally targeted Marcoms campaign, which I'll come on to in a minute. If we go to the next slide, please. So there's um, been a lot of conversation sort of within our discipline uh, and today as well, and in the questions, I was really, really interested in reading all of those questions that are coming through about how, you know, just wanting someone to do something isn't enough, is it? You've got to manage the network and so you've got to lock in those parking um, standards that you want to have that will, will help bring about the behaviour change that you need. And I saw a really interesting st statistic again in the questions about, you know, if you actually just try to promote it and get people to do it, you'll get a percentage return. But actually, if you try and lock in that by, by looking at that parking policy and that road reallocation, um, you're going to be more effective. So an effective campaign does need to have that management of your network. You've then got to create the capacity. Um, so you've got to, well, it's your cycle lanes, it's your off-road cycle lanes, or um, it's your road reallocation for public bus, uh, for, for buses, or your signal reprioritization, or anything that you want to do within that capacity and network. But then the third one is, is that changing of behavior to actually kind of deliver what you want for your city. But behaviour change alone doesn't result in the mode shift to actually balance your transport network to reduce that congestion so that actually people do feel safer on the road if they're walking or cycling um, and to give that bus priority. So it's 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 all of these three things and, and that's kind of how I, um, the, the lens within which I see these things through. So if we just go on to the next slide. So th th this is my attempt to kind of give you a bit of a, a sort of a systems thinking approach. Um, again, this is developed with my colleagues in MOTS when we were looking at um, the Birmingham Commonwealth Games, uh, the new sort of transport strategy for the Birmingham Commonwealth Games and the travel demand management strategy behind how we keep Birmingham moving. But equally so, I know it's been being used at the moment for COP26 and I'll, I'll come on to it again in a minute. So what you... What you always start with is understanding the scale of the challenge. So you look at that data and everything is data led. It all starts with data. Where's the propensity for change? Um, you know, there's brilliant tools available to you that show how many people own a bike or have access to a bike um, or have proximity to the lanes that you might want to put in. So everything's got to be data led. From that data, develop your core narrative. What do you want people to do? Do you want them to walk or cycle more, use public transport, drive less, drive a different time, drive on a different route? Uh, not drive at all, stay at home, work from home, that, that data will feed into that narrative um, that you can then, that basically sets, could you just go back please, uh, that goes back to, to, to sort of where you, you bring everything in from. You then come to that point of delivering that behaviour change and what you need to do now is the audience segmentation. So you need to get your audience identified into which groups. Now you've got background demand, who are the, the lots of people at the top, and then you've got travel advice for business. So I, I've kind of brought that out as a separate section because um, the, the highest number of journeys that you're probably going to try to influence are those commuter journeys. Leisure has a place, obviously, but it's not made at the same volume and at the same time. And I know sort of we might be talking sort of pre-pandemic now, but we will return to some kind of um, volume of movement. We are starting to see a volume of movement happening at particular times. So... Um, then you move into the, the, so you need that audience segmentation is critically important because when you come back to those personal motivators, you've got to understand who you're going to, their journey purpose, you know, what are you saying to them and why. You then got that messaging matrix, which is essentially you set out your messages that you want to actually feed through all of the different channels. You then go out and engage and you don't go out and do that engagement until you've got this whole body of work done before. Because although it's like an iceberg, you know, the, the marketing and the communication side is that top slice, but underneath all of that data and analytics need to have happened and started. So then the monitoring and evaluation um, needs to happen because then it will bring you back to that data to see what you're doing and what you need to rethink or, or turn up or turn down. And then if you're working in an event space, for example, for a major event, you'd have operational delivery and legacy there as well. And at the bottom, you know, what sort of guiding principles, the frame within which you're working is the governance, program management, and that looking at risk. But marketing and communications is a kind of a box that sits um, over the messaging matrix, engagement, monitoring, and evaluation. So it, it, it's sort of, it, 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 it's a lens within which you, with, with which you see um, quite a lot of those parts in that system. 
could you go to the next slide please and i think if i um if i just put it simply it, it's always just getting the right advice to the right people at the right time in the right way so what do you want people to do based on what your data is telling you about how you want your city to move who is your audience segment them by mode by geography by journey purpose because those three things make a difference as to what those people can do how do you want to get that information to them at what time whether is it before they travel is it on their journey is it after their journey is it all three and what communi communication channel will you get to that transport user so don't just expect to put a billboard up and create change and i think um there's a question in the chat about sort of what percentages but actually if you just did pure sort of advertising marketing you're looking at very very low percentages of modal modal shift but if you actually go and directly engage on a one-to-one -one level you will actually have a transformational level of change but it takes more effort so you've just got to have a real balance according to what you've got um and uh, uh, the resources and availability of time that you've got available to you and then what channel will get to that transport user you know i it's this is we could have a whole conversation together just on the channel use um uh, and, and again it comes back to knowing what audience looks at what channel but I, i'm going to come on to that again in a minute while we go through off some examples so if we go to the next slide please apologies for my um nasal tones i've <laughs> i've got a, a bit of a cold but i, um, I do apologize if it's a bit horrible to listen to and then you know sat behind all of these of course you need those behavioral change principles the ones i like to use the ones that we um you know kind of underpin a lot of the work that we do in this space are our easter which is obviously our behavioral insights uh, government's behavioral insights unit before it was disbanded came up with this easy attractive social and timely they're really really good ones to use if you haven't come across them before and if we go to the next uh, slide please now, now this again i there's some really sort of key slides in in the deck but that I, I keep coming back to when I'm talking about sort of how to develop and deliver behavior change and one of them is touch points and I'm coming back to that point that I was just making about communication channels if you want to get 10 20 30 40 50 60 percent you can do you can do um you know a touch point with leisure travelers where a touch point will be when they see something that tells them what you want them to see so you know cycling could be quicker or we've got active travel lanes and they're fantastic use them <clears throat> and then you have businesses and you probably you know should look at doing sort of one-to-one -one advice with them uh travel in public you might need three to four touch points without using radio and freight you might need to go to 10 operators <clears throat> excuse me so that's to kind of get a 10 and then to move up and up what you need to do oh sorry what you need to keep doing is increasing the number of touch points <coughs> Oh, sorry, it's not. <coughs> oh, I do apologize. So you need to keep increasing the touch points that people have access to um, to increase the level of behavior change. And this is where it gets a bit expensive and this is where there's a lot of time and effort and energy consumed but it's where you get the results it's where you really really do start to see the impact of what you're trying to achieve if you could go to the next slide please so i'm going to rattle through a couple of examples so this is the london olympics obviously it's nine no how many years ago now uh many years ago nine years but it really set the standard it set a base a baseline and a kind of a benchmark about what you could do if you had a lot of money and really really wanted to kind of get a message out and achieve enormous behavioral change so we had twitter we had um you know journey planners specifically built journey planners we had websites with interactive maps on it we had everything that you could possibly get your hands on and we spent 36 million on it so you know if you're going to run a campaign learn learn from the ones that have had the money spent on them and then just take what you like from them so if we go on to the next one please and then if you i'm just going to rattle through a couple of the examples which are really good to use in terms of understanding motivators and what kind of um, um what kind of results you can get from them so london bridge what we use as a motivator in london uh, was time so so here we were saying well actually if you waited and tried to catch a train at these particular times you'd be waiting on that station for you know 30 40 minutes you don't want to do that so why don't you travel at a different time so time 
and the impact of time uh, of, of congestion and, and, and busyness on journeys with users are motivated for London. But what it motivated people to do was to actually get on their bike and to walk. And we saw the highest legacy results from cycling from the London Olympics using, um, you know, reduction in um, or, or time spent traveling as a catalyst to move people to, to cycling. So um, if you just go to the next slide, please. And then, you know, cycling could be the quickest way. Again, think about that motivator in terms of movement. But one of the really important things to notice from this slide here is look at the partners that had to get together. And so listen to Anna at the beginning um, and listen to John talk about Birmingham. You know, the number of people that you have to get across something um, to actually uh, to, to, to deliver these kind of projects is immense. And one of the slides I wanted to put on here but took off at the last minute was a governance structure that I had to put in place for all of the stakeholders and partners that we needed to get together to actually have a sensible conversation about, um, you know, who we would need to engage with uh, politically and, and in any other way to actually deliver um, uh, a, a just a behaviour change campaign that said something like this. So it, it's it's quite an important point if you're thinking about doing this is to make sure you've got all your partners lined up. So if you go to the next slide, please. And we'll come back to Glasgow now. So, you know, the Glasgow Commonwealth Games. Um, this is, uh, you won't be able to see some of the writing in here, but actually this is, uh, again, train stations. And we were saying if we wanted to get to the um, to the, to the the uh, velodrome, for example, you know, if you wanted to travel it, you know, this line was going to the velodrome. So actually, if you tried as a commuter to get on at this point, you'd be waiting, you know, a significant amount of time to get on it. Uh, and again, that the, the motivator was time. Um, and, and disruption to journey. And then we followed up by saying, but actually, if you cycled, it would only take this this long. So if you could just move on to the next slide, please. And then this was, you know, I'll just rattle through a few through these now, but this was a public facing kind of element. I don't know if you remember these, but you know, beat the traffic. Um, and so looking at the dates. So that single source of truth that I talked about, that 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 kind of that that narrative that you never defer away from. Um, you, you keep it going and you're kind of steely in your resolve about what you say and why you say it. And you always point people to one single source of truth. So get ready for get ready Glasgow or at Games Travel 2014. So go to the next slide, please. Again, another one here, um, just a couple of examples. You might have seen this at bus stops or above the stations. You know, it will be busier, the games are on their way, but these these rolled out and they got more and more. more. And these are the touch points that I was talking about before, if you want to um, do that. But this is all kind of above the line communication side of the game. So actually, we could flick through the next ones quite quickly, I think. And COP26, which is just about to come onto your doorstep. Um, lots and lots and lots of work being done on the behaviour change piece there. Understanding what's going to be busy, when and where, why, how much, and what we want people to do differently. Um, you know, even Graham Day here saying, I urge commuters, businesses to take time to read the transport plan, familiarise themselves with the road process. But behind this sits the next piece of advice, which is walking and cycling could be a quicker way of making your journey. Here's a map and here, here's how you find that information. If we go to the next slide, please. This is Sydney. Sydney is a motivator of, of change and investment, but the big red line that you can see there, the reason I was brought in was actually because they were building a light rail system followed by a metro. And that was going to actually dig up the centre of the city. It was going to cause enormous disruption. Um, and it was going to really impact on people's journey times. And so what we wanted to show was like, actually, look, look at the level of investment that's happening in your city. It's a positive news story, but things are going to be different. Things are going to have to change. If you go to the next slide, please. And, um, 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 you know, cars being the largest contributor, uh, but actually carrying the smallest number of people was another kind of, um, you know, mechanism for change, uh, uh, you know, the, the narrative that they built it behind it. And then if you go on to the next slide, the, the, the level of effort that we had to go to, but we got an 11% reduction in vehicles entering the CBD and the AM peaks, the CBD City Town Centre. Um, and then you had big businesses, workshops, drop-ins, business intermediaries. You went to all of those through um, a one-to-one, -one, um, you know, actual kind of um, direct engagement with them. Uh, and that's what transformed the fortunes and actually kept Sydney moving um, during a period of intense disruption. Go to the next slide, please. And then, you know, these are just um, just to show you the kind of it, to thinking about those touch points, thinking about the number of times that you need to remind people that, you know, to, to do something or to, to get on board or to go somewhere for more information. This was just, a, you know, some of the collateral that we use that we use on the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. You know, we had um, the, the, the little USB sticks and we had pens. I've probably still got about 
10 in the cupboard somewhere. Um, and, you know, we had water bottles, we had bags. So again, these are all touch points are just ways that you help people see this particular campaign. Can you go to the next slide, please? And then the last one to tell you really was about the, 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 the TDM strategy that was used, the behaviour change strategy that was used to be, uh, that was employed um, on the return to education where there was a 300,000 shortfall of spaces on public transport for children to use to get back to, um, back to education. And so um, each of the 79 English local transport authorities actually put in place a, um, a travel demand management strategy to support um, a change in movement and to actually to get children to walk and cycle more. And again, the catalyst this time was, look, there's not going to be enough space on public transport. And this was a big DSC funded initiative. And then on the next slide, we'll just come to the end now. So that I think, you know, just again, sort of tongue in cheek, you can lead a horse to water. You, you can want all of these massively laudable things, but it doesn't necessarily mean they come. So this behavioral change campaigns, these TDM campaigns are actually how you get a horse to drink. Be systematic and data driven in what you do, you know, focus on um, influencing enough people enough uh, and getting to the right people. Link back to those personal motivators. You might want this desperately, but it doesn't mean that they will. Have your information in, don't, in one place, but, but don't worry about maths or journey planners or stuff if you actually, you know, Google will work just fine. Have that consistent, recognisable brand. I've heard it said before. Um, and then uh, the st standing strong in the face of the opposition. Having your narrative set and signed up to don't deviate and always, always be data led. Um, apologies for that coughing fit in the middle. I'm going to mute myself now um, and I think uh, move on to the next speaker and then die in the corner. <laughs> Rose, Rose, thanks very much for, for that. There was a lot of food for thought and yes, I felt for you there with uh, the coughing. So uh, you can certainly go away and get a nice cold drink of, of water now um, while we we'll get the other two speakers on. Um, we've got Robin and Duncan still to come, and we're running a little bit short of time. So, Robin and Duncan, if you can try and keep it close to about the ten minute mark, that will give us about fifteen minutes for um, for questions, because there's quite a lot of questions coming in. So, um, Robin uh, is the co-chair and of Coalition for Healthy Streets and Active Travel in Oxfordshire. He's got a significant amount of marketing and campaigning experience, both locally and nationally. And uh, Robin works as a as a business con consultant um, and his prior executive level experience at Natural England and Vodafone. He's also uh, a keen cyclist and walking advocate, a trustee of Cycling UK and chair of Oxfordshire Cycling Network. So over to you, Robin. Great. Thank you very much. And um, if I go to the next slide, um, I think the, the thing I'm going to tell you, so I come from a, a small town in Oxfordshire and uh, the question really here is, what can I tell you in the, the great Scottish city of Glasgow, which uh, I thoroughly uh, enjoy visiting on the, t on the times that I have. And, and really it's a story about the, the value of community input. So I hope I'm talking to an audience that includes both people on the, on the various local authorities and also um, perhaps some campaigners and, um, and I can tell you some things about uh, working together and the benefits of, of that. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. Um, so Ab Abingdon is a, a market town of about 40,000 people, about seven miles south of Oxford. Uh, there's a little map to help you find it there. We can go on to the next one. Don't need to talk too much, and um, I, as well as the a kind of larger group that spans the county, um, we've set up a smaller campaign group in the town, um, and we decided uh, essentially to develop our own LC Whip. So uh, hopefully most of you know what an LC Whip is. It's a, a local cycling and walking infrastructure plan, uh, essentially a plan of cycling and walking routes that um, really is a, it's a key enabler of funding from the Department of Transport. Um, it helps uh, councils to also to gain money from developers uh, through planning gain where they're developing houses or businesses. And from a campaigner's point of view, it's also something consistent that we can uh, campaign for. Um, but the, the problem for us was that our, our council, it's local, it's Oxfordshire County Council, that's the transport authority, has very limited resources. Essentially it has 10 market towns after after Oxford itself 
um, but only one person developing LC whips and they were currently working on the rate of about one per year. So we, we could be waiting quite a long time in the queue and we wanted to uh, get up that queue. Um, and then uh, lockdown came along and the pandemic and we saw this big boom in cycling and walking uh, supported by gear change and the emergency funding. Uh, and also a lot of us were out uh, volunteering to do medicine deliveries on our bikes. And I, for one, discovered all these hidden routes around the town, um, uh, all kinds of interesting back alleys and things, uh, mostly illegal for cycling. And um, we had more time on our hands. So we thought, let's let's develop our own plan. We'll go on to the next page. Um, so we, we, uh, this is the process we uh, worked through. I'm going to take you through this process step by step. Um, I won't go, I won't pause through the detail. I'll just give you the general impact of it because it's, it's really the fact that such a process is possible and then the pros and cons of it um, that I'll sum up at the end. So if we go on to the next page. Uh, so we formed a team, uh, it was essentially comprised of people from cycling groups, the sustainability group, um, the health walks team, which was uh, partly run with the Ramblers and people from the town council. In all, um, we had about 40 people contributing. We called ourselves Abingdon Liverpool Streets. Next. Uh, and then um, I, from the knowledge I'd amassed and talking to a few uh, kind of old timers, people who'd lived in the town for a long time, worked out uh, this network map um, comprised of some main uh, radial routes and then uh, there's a couple of ring roads and connectors uh, between them. The, the distance from the centre, that little triangle in the centre to the outside is about two miles so it's a, it's a very cyclable town, it's pretty much flat. Um, in fact you, it, it's reasonably possible to walk the whole thing but certainly for, for cycling um, it's, a, it's a very viable route and um uh, and this proved a, a great basis once we'd done this it, it was quite possible to divide the routes up between people so if we go on to the next page um i then uh drew up a, a kind of template and a guidebook for the different people who were going to survey uh the routes um so mo most of this slide is is essentially a section from that uh, template which is very simple it just had four columns uh and it, it was in Word or Google Docs for the people without Word. One was uh, a place where they could put pictures and a, a basic description of where they were, what it's like today, what it could be in the future, and, and a kind of column for quick fixes that would be cheaper. And the guidebook, well, we were doing this before LTM 120, so I put together there a very simple eight-page guide that, rep, that used some of the um, existing guidance from Cycle Nation, uh, London Cycling Design Standards, um, the, the Wheels for Wellbeing Guide to Inclusive Cycling, and and also I should reference the Ideas for Beers, Ideas with Beers um, information uh, exchange uh, that happens on Tuesday evenings, which is a fantastic place for um, professionals and campaigners. Um, John Dales will certainly know about it because uh, Brian Deegan, who he works with. Um, is one of the one of the two people who basically run it. It's a fantastic place if you haven't met it to uh, tune into. Um, next, and of course, as with Spain, we found uh, some terrible things, some uh, horrible bits of painted cycle lane that are too narrow, and people park in them all the time. Um, and if we go on to the next page. Also, some delights. There's a there's this fantastic uh, path, the Daisy Bank path, that goes down the middle of kind of thousands of houses um it's about uh, a mile long um and it connects almost to the edge of town to almost the center without crossing a road um it's a bit narrow um but most of the cyclists who use it uh use it uh, slowly um and uh, give space to pedestrians so it's a really fantastic asset um i'll, I'll just give those two examples any any town or city is going to have some of those horrors and some of those delights. Next. Um, we also thought about LTNs and, and it turns out that Abingdon is already pretty much low traffic neighborhoods. Um, it, it's an interesting town, I guess like many others, it's the center is, um, um, some of it's medieval and then there's a Victorian and then it kind of builds out in the, you can always tell the rings of 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 2000s. Um, but a lot of it is built 
they're built with cul-de-sacs or low traffic principles. I'm, I'm in a street which basically has filters that were put probably put in, well, um, maybe Victorian times, but maybe taken out and replaced during the uh, during the uh, World War Two. But um, uh, there aren't a lot of places where rat runs are a problem. Next. Uh, and then having gathered all that survey data uh, or sent people out to do the surveys um, who were essentially found through the cycling groups and the sustainability and walking groups, um, uh, there was a lot of follow up to do. So some people did a really good job. Um, some decided they couldn't do it. Some some had uh, came back but with gaps or lower quality um, and um, it was locked down, so I was too busy uh, with my consulting work that had dropped away. Uh, so I actually had plenty of time to go out and fill in some gaps. Um, sometimes I took my secateurs and did a bit of vegetation clearance while I was out there. But um, it, it did quite a lot of editing work to get it to a reasonable level of uh, quality and consistency, and, and that maybe took another month. The end result of that was about 400 pages over 25 routes. Um, covering what it was, what the routes are like today, a proposal for quick fixes and a proposal for a longer term future. So we go on to the next page and then having got all that source material, uh, we could compile a summary report, uh, which amounts about 30 pages, um, uh, which we sent to all the relevant councillors and officers uh, in three tiers of council. So we've got county, district and, and town. We go to the next page. And that really covers, the key thing about that is prioritization. So we thought about where people want to travel using our own local knowledge, plus the propensities of cycling models, where needs improving. So a particular source of that was um, the accident, sorry, don't call them accidents, call them collisions, casualties, casualty data from crash map and cycle streets. And also what's easy to improve or difficult to improve based on our, our survey data. And we were really trying to answer the questions, what do you do if you just have a small amount of money, a medium amount of money or, or a large amount of money to improve the network? And if we go on to the next page, we, you can see we, we built that out. You won't see much detail on the slide on the screen, but you'll, you'll see a map kind of gradually changing in colour from mostly red to mostly green, which means good quality, or blue, which means LTN 120 standards, uh, essentially as you speak, spend more money. So the, 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 the second stage in this is, is fixing essentially five sections of the network, which could be done fairly cheaply, but have major safety problems. And then gradually build, it builds out into a, a low cost network and then a coherent network before getting to the full uh, plan. So we go on uh, from there. Um, so while we were doing that, um, we had essentially two pieces of good news. One, one was a roundabout remodeled and one of the housing developer had agreed to um, uh, fund one of the routes. And then since the work we've done, um, both Sustrans and the County Council have um, uh, agreed funding for two uh, design studies of particular uh, problems we identified as high problems, so that's a direct result of our work, so that's a, a real positive. And our, our plan is now being used as input to an official uh, LC WIP. Uh, so we've achieved our initial aim of kind of elevating ourselves up to uh, the priority list. And we're, we're all, Abingdon is also developing a neighbourhood plan, and I'm, I'm on the uh, committee for that and making sure that cycling and walking are well embedded in that, which is not proving difficult because that there's a solid message from the whole community of Abingdon that it needs to be uh, prioritised. So next page, and really just to round off, I want to talk about the, some of the learnings here. I think there's two main ones. One is that there's a real benefit of the local route knowledge here, but we are not highways engineers. So we, um, although I have read LTM 120 and I go to the ideas with these sessions. I, I know a bit about costings and I know turning arcs and visibility displays exist, but I don't, I'm not expert enough to use them. So the best results I think will come from joint council and community efforts. And, and that's actually an approach that's being used in two other towns uh, in Oxfordshire. 
Uh, so the LC, LC whips, those are aiming to use a mix of um, a, a kind of a council led initiative, which will use people in the community to do some of the uh, on the ground work, which I'm hoping will be a best of both worlds rather than a culture clash. And then, of course, the, the, you may have sensed that this takes time to organize and quality control. So it needs a, a project leader. Um, it needs a quality controller. And in Abingdon, I, I kind of volunteered myself to do that um, because I had the time and the, uh, the will. But it, it really needs um, somebody to um, uh, step up and uh, uh, do that. And I shall just leave you with a picture of um, the centre of Abingdon. Uh, where, where we have uh, on the left the marvellous uh, county hall um, for when Abingdon was actually the county town of Berkshire, um, a county which no longer exists. Thank you very much. Robin, thanks very much for, for that um, and keeping to time it's always always helps. Um, <laughs> we've, uh, we've caught up a bit time-wise and I, I don't want to shorten the the Q and A session, so we'll hand over to Duncan just now, and um, certainly don't don't shorten your pitch too much, Duncan, as I think we've got enough time if we continue through to four o'clock at the, the latest, as per it was advertised the webinar. So, um, Duncan is head of campaigns and advocacy in Cycling UK. He's head of campaigns which promotes all forms of cycling so that um, uh, people of all ages can cycle safely, easily, enjoyable. And um, Duncan leads the, the Cycling UK's campaigning, which is a key aspect um, of which educational awareness uh, to promote behaviour change is quite key. So Duncan, over to you. Thanks very much, Marshall. And I'm conscious of the time, and I'm the, the last to go today. So, having heard from so many excellent speakers and having heard so much information, I thought I'd change the tone a little for the last presentation and do perhaps some uh, bigger picture stuff, if that makes sense. Um, I looked at the question for this sort of um, this webinar, delivering an active travel strategy, and when I was pondering it, I just thought that perhaps a a better question for me to address would be how do you deliver strategies which deliver on active travel and if that sounds like a semantic difference uh, the reason i put it that way is because quite often it's evident there's a lot of goodwill in local authorities in relation to various plans and policies but quite often there's a problem with integration and that's the problem that leads to a problem with delivery next slide please so uh, if we focus on the issue of um, integration, uh, the cumulative effects sometimes of policies are that we have strategies which really are more designed towards or the delivery of um, uh, that. The, sorry, the, 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 the strategies would end up designing for car dependency rather than the delivery of active travel. Uh, and a good way to look at that is, is so many local authorities have an active travel plan and a pretty good one and most will have a local plan and most will have a plan about air quality and many will have declared a climate emergency and if you look at those plans in isolation they're often very good but often there's also a failure or a limitation on the cross departmental integrated delivery strategy and that's an issue which is quite often prevalent in those cities and areas where we don't see what we're seeing in Birmingham and Glasgow uh, and we're seeing less of a move towards delivery of the strategy. Next slide please. Uh, and at that point I thought I'd break the, uh, the list of information with a bit of a personal tale. So uh, um, a couple of years ago I moved in to live with my partner in a town in Kent. Apologies for attending a a uh, conference that's leading on Glasgow and talking about something in Kent, but I think this story will resonate with people across the UK. Uh, and I moved into an estate, a new build estate that had, had been finished about six months earlier, about a mile as the crow flies out of the town centre. I've always been fairly active, I've always walked a lot, I've always cycled, and then I, I was actually sitting writing. Um, 
a suggestion for a land or conference thinking about what I was going to write about and I suddenly realized I was about to get up to drive into the town center and I started reflecting on it and thinking I've got in the habit of getting in the car to drive to Tombridge train station less than a mile as the crow flies and I've got in the habit of driving to go and get a paper and a pint of milk and the reason for it was because I was living in an estate where you couldn't walk into the town centre and you couldn't ride your bike into the town centre without heading out of town to a roundabout, round the A roads, round another roundabout, and to do a, a long detour round on a horrible place to either walk or cycle to get back in to the town centre. And that was a product of the design of the estate that I'd moved into. And consequently, for the first time in my life, I was getting fat. I wasn't spending any money in a town which had a strategy to effectively regenerate the town centre because all the shops were shutting. And, and despite the fact that in Kent and Tombridge there were all sorts of great strategies, none of them were integrated. And within six months of moving somewhere new, my whole life habits and modes of travelling were changing. And I was driving where I would otherwise have walked or cycled because my choices were being designed out of me, out for me. Next slide, please. Uh, and I, I mention that because we often have those conversations or hear those comments about why people don't cycle or they don't walk. And I just stuck down some quotes from a conference I attended a couple of years ago, largely by people who worked in local authorities, passionate people who wanted to actually see the delivery of active travel where they lived and worked. Um, but between them, there was a limited amount of integration of the policies they were tasked with delivering. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, again, lightening the move, moved, given that it's half past three and we're moving towards the end. I thought I'd just include this image because it reminded me of some of those scratching heads that we sometimes see when questions about where active travel fits are, are, are raised in local authorities because we have different people addressing different parts of strategies, some thinking about air quality, some thinking about active travel, some thinking about climate emissions, some thinking about the regeneration of the high street. Next slide, please. And we end up in a situation where um, you can almost imagine people sitting in their separate rooms, sitting on separate Zoom calls, sitting in separate silos, all very nobly thinking about what needs to be delivered, their part in it, and what they would like to achieve to keep to their key performance indicators and matrices. But sometimes we're not seeing that integrated cross-team and cross-departmental delivery. I think we've heard quite a bit about that today, about how it is working in Glasgow and Birmingham. And so I didn't want that to sound as though that was a reflection on what's happening in those places. And I'm sure there are places where there is that integration. But the reflection I have from speaking to campaigners around the country who are frustrated about lack of progress and to councillors, often active travel officers, who are frustrated about their inability to deliver that which they wish to deliver is that quite often something happens betwixt the plan and delivery and that's often because the strategy isn't integrated at a high enough level within the council so i thought i'd throw that open as one of those things that is probably worthy of reflection because that shouldn't be rocket science and it shouldn't be something that's beyond the gift of all of us to try and make some progress with. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I suppose if we're trying to move something up, the priority of any decision maker, whether it's our own workplaces, whether it's within a local authority, whether it's in national government, what we always like to do is show what the burning platform is and why this is so important. And when people talk about cycling, walking and active travel, we often hear conversations about public health, or about air quality, 
we need to reduce transport emissions, we need to reduce congestion. Uh, and one reflection I had was that quite often we, we refer to those as what it might call the burning platform, when in reality, the burning platform is the lack of an integrated strategy to move away from car dependency with all the health congestion pollution and quality of life consequences which follow and in reality the the issue that we should be looking at is the solution to those problems and the prioritization of the solution of that because that's the burning platform as it were next slide please um but of course it's not always easy to change travel habits you only need to speak to somebody who's tried to give up smoke, smoking or tried to stick to a diet or reduce any other dependency to know that's the situation. I wanted to throw that in because uh, John Dales mentioned that earlier today when talking about behaviour change and how sometimes in the past we've focused, we've focused a lot within active travel conversations about infrastructure. Um, you, you can't make modal shift on a huge scale without investing in that infrastructure but if we're going to make that accessible for all and to maximize the delivery of the benefits there is that need to also consider the behavior change work um, that's been mentioned already in terms of uh, one of our speakers talking about the east model but another way of looking at it is to think about capability opportunity and motivation uh, and of course, um, if we're thinking about, sorry, next slide, please, uh, capability, opportunity uh, and motivation. And 36% of people responding to a YouGov survey have, have indicated that they could rethink their travel habits uh, and that you would like to use their cars less, and use active travel more. The key to actually to living an active travel strategy is enabling them to do so. Um, but in terms of capability, they can only do that if they have access to a bike. And I just thought I'd throw this one in in terms of behaviour change pro programmes. Uh, next slide, please. In Scotland, only 17% of households with an income of less than £15,000 actually have access to a bike. And that's one of the reasons why behaviour change programmes which complement the infrastructure measures are so important. Next slide, please. I've just did a quick example of one that we've uh, have running through site in the UK and Scotland, which is the Shift program, which is designed to effectively support communities. And I'm conscious of the time, so I'll just charge through to the last slide, um, because if there's any concern about um, why this is necessary, um, I think we'll just go back to that simple stat. We've got over 50% of car journeys uh, in the UK between one kilometre mm -hmm. and two kilometres and the big win ask of course the big ticket win would be to shift a significant mm -hmm. proportion of those to active travel. Um, finally it's the last slide of the day so if we just jump to that I thought I'd leave on the positive note and thinking about how tomorrow could be different. Some of the solutions are not rocket science, some of them are not difficult uh, and it simply is a question really of integration um, so that those plans that many councils have got in place and are trying to deliver are integrated to an overall strategy to reduce car dependency and get more people walking and cycling and with that I will leave it and pass back to you Marshall. Thanks very much Duncan that was, uh, that was excellent. Um, are, could the other panellists put on their webcams please? Don't know if uh, <clears throat> don't know if John others oh, John, right? Uh, that's that's great. Uh, well, thanks very much, everyone, for those really enlightening presentations. Uh, as you can imagine, there are quite a number of questions that have have come in. I'll try and try and go through them as as quickly as as possible as it's approaching twenty fifty four. Um. Rose, there was maybe a couple of questions here that were directed at yourself. First one would be, did you monitor the impact of communications work? 
Yep. So that there's actually two marsh. If you wouldn't mind, there's that one and the one that just come in at fifteen thirty five about cycle lanes um, and the Labour Tory kind of hearts and minds. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love to have a go at that as well. Only purely because I'm having that exact conversation at the moment. But um, on the monitoring of the um, the impact, yes. So the best place or the one that really just sort of stand out that I could talk to you about is the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. So we actually did. Um, with the, with the travel demand management strategy for a major event, you don't actually know what behaviour change you're going to achieve until day one of the games, and that's too late. So what you need to actually have is intention for change. Um, and so what you do beforehand, there's a lot of um, surveys to say, you know, are you thinking about changing what you do? What do you think you'll do differently? And how long do you think you'll keep that going for or whatever? And so what we used to have, and I'd have to present this back to board, um, to our sort of major project board, is to say, look, this is your risk, because actually 20% of the population is saying they've got any intention of doing something differently. And then that what that would do is give me the appetite and the, the, the backing to kind of ratchet up the, the volume within which we were talking about the behaviour change. So we would go through more channels, use more networks, have more touch points until we then do another survey that say um, either random or same sample to say, are you planning to do something different, X, Y, and Z? And then, and then during the whole course of the games, we would have um, this, this channel that would basically say, what, what have you done differently? What are you doing differently? And so we actually measured completely what the impact of our work was having locally, nationally, locally and regionally rather, which is where we had the problem with the trips and where we had over congestion. And so what we've done is apply that model to um, to other work. It, it doesn't work as well because you're not in that kind of like test case um, scenario, but with the DFT work on the COVID recovery work that they did um, for transport, we surveyed all of the 79 English local transport authorities before during the day, what was the impact of the, um, of, of the travel demand management activity. And I know for the Birmingham Commonwealth Games, they've got that kind of sewn into the fabric of, of everything they're gonna do. I don't know as much for COP26, um, but certainly, yeah, you, you, you can measure it. And it's been done a lot more, not not so much of the London Games onwards, but uh, the London Games, but, but now definitely. Sorry, Marshall, that was a long answer to that one but i was really i was really glad someone had asked it because it, it's a really important one to actually keep effectively measuring the impact of your work okay thanks like shows uh, maybe an another one that, that i picked up for yourself rose um was and and i wasn't aware of this research but some research has found that enablers deliver on average a five percent modal shift yeah but when you combine that with other deterrents it's led to um modal shift upwards of 40 percent yeah 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 no so there's some brilliant stats out there all around this i could quote a couple of more a couple more at you or was it vic reeves that said 79 percent of all statistics are made up on the spot so um but you know that there's plenty more floating about um but that's it's a really crucial one because that's how if you so you have it below through and above the line when you're talking about sort of going out to people and above is your, your media and your kind of mass broadcast marketing social is your middle through the line and then below the line is is me talking to you Marshall, and saying look we've got this brilliant active travel strategy for all these cycle lanes i'd really want to work with you to you know to figure out how you can do something different but equally then we're also going to take away your parking space um, and we're not going to provide anything but very expensive city center parking so me putting something on a billboard you know saying it's going to be great to great to cycle get on your bike you'll have yeah three four five percent uh, but if you combine that with um, direct advice, as well as locking that in with those parking strategies um, and with um, basically almost sort of funneling you to that particular choice, making sure that it's a manageable distance for you to cycle, of course, that's how you translate that into those percentages. Um, so that's quite, it, it, so that's why travel demand management is network management, capacity creation and behavior change because behavior change on its own is at two, three, four, five percent, and you never get that absolute lock-in of behaviour change. We managed eleven percent in Sydney with no uh, punitive measures, so to speak. That was just through um, a fiscally kind of rewarding people to travel differently and making it a very nice experience for them. But otherwise, no, it's it's nowhere near as effective. I'll, I'll throw the next question open to the panel. Whoever wants to to answer this one, um, it, it maybe comes in, in two parts. We didn't touch an awful lot on walking, uh, the majority was in cycling, but um, how can it be ensured that data specific to walking 
is both collected and meaningful? And indeed, um, is there enough data out there, especially on women's and children's trips? Um, and what other data do you think we need? Anyone want to volunteer? John? Oh, you're, you're on mute, John. So I was. Um, uh, we know next to nothing about walking in general terms. And that's often for two reasons. One is we just haven't counted that stuff in the past. <clears throat> I know that in Glasgow there are cordon surveys and actually quite for, for, for and some, some some regular survey points. But actually one of the things I think we really struggle with is walking, and this is why our data is partial and so is that at junctions and so forth, it's really, or even on links, it's really easy to get a vehicle or a, which could include a cycle moving along or turning or whatever it might be. People on foot is great, can go virtually anywhere, do all sorts of things. And actually, therefore, quite often in the past, sheer numbers, other than in particular locations, numbers using a bridge, numbers crossing a road, perhaps numbers crossing a road near to a crossing, all those things were, were done occasionally, but our, our general database is very poor and often because we 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 we've treated walking even even at the, the, the simple level of how much walking is there when the surveys are done we we often undervalue the role of walking as a feeder to something else so you know we lose walking because of main mode you know how many people walk to the station how many walk frankly to, to you know where do they go once they park their bike they they then also walk so the fact that the walking is a little bit like breathing and we just all do it all the time, obviously we, it would be great if more people did it, means that we really struggle with having base data. And I would say that sometimes actually just having a big volume of data, more people who do it are walking than beforehand, isn't terribly helpful in terms of focusing design effort in any case. The, the, the only thing I'd really add to that at the moment is a, beyond the fact that we should be paying a lot more respect to walking and therefore counting as much of it as we as we can or rather in different ways but do that intelligently. In, in terms of doing the intelligent, one of the things we're able to do more and more now is with machine le learning and, and using cameras that actually follow people and very often it's it's not just the numbers of people walking but it's how they behave in any given area that is the best prompt for deciding how we what we need to do in response to that where well how are they crossing why what are people doing in the street that, that they that we're not providing for that looks like that we should and that kind of information that turns into basically turns a lot of walking activity into lines on a map that you can see overlaid that shows you where the pressure points are and that kind of information is really really helpful it can be a little bit more expensive at the moment i think because the more and more people are doing it it should become cheaper but I think we need to be a little bit more, I suppose, in, we need to do it more, but we need to be more intelligent about it, because the reason we didn't do it beforehand is we, 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 we didn't really think often enough that, that, that those numbers were terribly important, or rather that they told the story. And so in terms of the detail, I, I think we need to use some of those more intelligent methods. Um, but I do think when we're asking our general surveys, and I'm sure that the, the, Rose, I'd be surprised if she didn't have something to say about this, is just understanding the centrality of walking to virtually every single trip and it gets lost in the numbers you know as we all kind of walk over well, i say all you know what i mean but walk out of our houses whatever we're then going to i have to walk to get my bike out i have to you know and to and from the car the centrality of walking and then the, and, the, and the importance of walking in, in terms of the overall journey choice if if it's a pain in the neck to walk to the bus, oh, I, I, have a, I have a car available, I might do that. So it's understanding the, the, those, those critical but very short length trips uh, as, as, an, as, as, a, as a part of, of our overall modal choice that I think we need to do a lot better at as well. That, that's great, John. Thanks. Rose or Robin and Duncan, anything to, any further thoughts on that one? Um, Robin? I'll go. So, um, yeah, the walking aspect of our project was quite interesting. We found um, getting walking input was reasonably easy. Um, we we got some we, we, as we were socialising it. We got some interesting comments of this looks like a cycling plan, not a walking plan. But that was mostly because the map inherently has lots of long routes, so it looks like it's lots of cycling routes. But when you delve into it, 
most of the walking interventions will be particular places where there are crossing problems um they're, they're much more point solutions than long longer route solutions the bit where we did have a problem getting good input was actually from from the disa disabled community because there isn't a a good single place that you there isn't a disabled or inclusive mobility group uh, in Abingdon that we could go and talk to. Um, so I have occasionally now stopped people in wheelchairs and mobility scooters and said, "Hi, I'm from Abingdon Liverpool Streets. Where do you have problems getting around?" Uh, which is a bit weird to do, but um, <laughs> it's uh, it provides useful inputs. And uh, actually, it turns out a lot of them are very happy to talk, and they they all have. Um, very similar problems. It's it's things like drop curbs. It's things like cars parked to obstruct pavements. It's it's things that I'm sure a lot of people here are very familiar with. R it's also anything? bumpy pavements. Yeah. Bumpy was pavements. Anything? I won't come in on that one, Marshall, because obviously we've got limited time and there's lots of other questions, and I think that's been covered brilliantly by by both Robin and John. But there is a there is a question. I'd really love to pick up that's got kind of a theme throughout quite a lot of the ones I've seen popping up and that's about the sort of the hearts and minds and the LTN kind of backlash and LC Whip mm -hmm. backlash and, and that and, and if you don't mind Marshall without me having just totally <laughs> overruled your job as chair which I'm so sorry about I'm just I'm so keen to 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 kind of give a bit of thought on this one because I think it's a really, really important issue with everything that's been talked about today and what, what you're starting to do in Glasgow. Yep. And, and so, because we're suffering the same, I don't know whether you know, Cheshire Western Chester had, um, I think it went nationally, actually, we had a massive aggressive backlash to our active travel lanes that went in and the road reallocation that we undertook. Um, it was actually nine people, um, but those people were vocal. Um, there were actually some of them, I don't even think there was nine, I think there was actually six, but they have double personalities and kind of like social media profiles. Um, there was politics involved and it became sort of culture war. Um, and there was vile, vile sort of death threats and disgusting habits, uh, disgusting behaviours happening across the board until we had to suspend them. Um, and it's it, that's what I've sort of come into. Uh, that's the kind of the, the directorate now is that we're, we're looking at what do we do, and and so what what everyone's in the danger of doing, and it becomes like a culture war, doesn't it? It's kind of like cars versus you know walkers and cyclists. It becomes this really really aggressive um, scenario, um, and and so but the one question I was just picking up on, Marsha, was the the getting the sort of Labour Tories on board and the hearts and minds of residents who oppose those cycle lanes. If you look at central government guidance at the moment on walking and cycling and active travel, it is the it is the most it's the strongest, most direct. Um, uh, this is sorry, Marsha, this is just sort of uh, English this is from DFT from Westminster at the moment. Uh, it, it's the strongest, most um, um, to the point guidance I've seen, and it says, you know, if you're thinking of taking something out, you better have an alternative. And you better be able to make that challenge and make it better. And, and otherwise we'll remove your funding, which is kind of the Liverpool city region experience. And so actually central government under a Tory rule at the moment has this mass directorate to direct sort of direction to, to be to be challenging, to do, um, you know, and to do that road reallocation, to make brave decisions. Otherwise funding won't be made available to you. So I think that's a really interesting card to have in your back pocket if you're having to have this dialogue across a, you know, a, a split. We've only got one seat between our Labour talk with Labour led but only by one seat. And actually, you know, Labour are ideologically more sort of set up behind this. So you can normally get a bit better engagement, but actually it's really useful to use that central government um, conversation back. So if you're not, if you take something out, you better have something better to put in. Um, and, and so we're trying to work really, really carefully with our comms department at the moment to get a narrative that we stand behind and that's, that we're steely in our resolve and we don't bend because those nine people can't, you know, disadvantage the maybe 600 other thousand who really, really want this to happen. Uh, and so it's not listening to the men, not listening to the few, but listening to the many. Um, but it's, mm. it's a huge topic. Yeah, I was I was aware that some English councils have recently scrapped several of their, their LTNs, and I was just wondering if there's any thoughts from the panel on what this means for similar action in, in other areas. Marshall, can I yeah. jump in on, on that yeah. one? And I'm, uh, I'm going to try and keep this really non-political and non-nation specific. It's following on from Rose's comments. Um, 
I think it would be fair to say that under a Conservative government dealing with transport in England, a Welsh Labour government dealing with that in Wales, and an SNP Green government leading that in Scotland, there are some of the boldest messages coming out in terms of aspirations for active travel that we've ever heard. Here's me trying to be non-political in relation to it. There's a difference of delivery across those. Um, but of course, delivery locally is the responsibility of local government. What we're seeing, particularly in England, however, is um, thus far a, a failure of the national government to work out what they are going to do if the local uh, government doesn't actually get the message that's being handed down from national government and effectively is ignoring the guidance about what should be delivered and how it should be delivered. And that's causing us probably more problems in England than it is in Wales and Scotland for others because it's a series of English councils of various political stripes and colours who are pretty bluntly ignoring national government guidance. That has significant implications um, for delivery of active travel in England if the government doesn't decide how it's going to deal with that. And thus far, it, it's yet to do so. Yeah. If I could just Jordan. add on to, to that, yeah, I mean, my local authority has just done exactly what you said. And and actually, it's a conflation of both what Duncan said and what Rose is, <coughs> was just saying, which is um, when the measures went in just over a year ago, <coughs> they were, frankly, not handled terribly well in terms of comms and messaging. And I think that's stuff, something that Anna alluded to earlier. And so, you know, because there was an urgency and it was understanding, I, you know, I think everyone would say, looking back now, we could still have done a better job at the time. But um, the council immediately went onto the back foot uh, because of the social media. And I, I couldn't say it was six or nine, but a relatively small number of people who made an extraordinary amount of noise and were very nasty in doing so, basically took hold of the narrative. And as we often know, that the the, 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 the you know people who would be um, for the message were quiet because they were rather cowed by that. But also people who don't care so much, but might be somewhat in the middle of that smile curve. Yeah, no, that's okay. They're not prepared to step out or know too much about this. Um, and so what you are, but but also what was an example of the, the council who um, uh, and I won't mention it or indeed the, the colour, but they, they are supportive of it. Their manifesto was talking about all. All these things as well and broadly speaking they're absolutely supportive of these kinds of measures but what was struck me as interesting was the two other main parties um both lobbied against hard because even though in another authority they be the people putting the stuff in it's just considered they thought that locally this is good news for us at the ballot box so it's not just the government is failing to do that what you find is national parties generally are, are are unable to keep local people in line because at the local level they just think aha this is making the incumbent uncomfortable and i will push for this even and so we're seeing parties that in, in this here in in this borough in question actually they were the people who got the climate emergency mo motion through and were very proud to have done that arguing against that or for all sorts of specious reasons and i think this rather comes back to and yet at the heart of this having now just taken the measures out literally last week the council in question does not know what the public at large thinks still doesn't know it has done a few surveys survey monkey here or this that there and that and the other it still doesn't know it still doesn't know what the general public think. it hasn't done that exercise of trying to work out doing some randomized surveys what people think but the noise associated with this was sufficient and i can't say that it was tiny but i suspect it was relatively small and I suppose this then comes back to what I was saying earlier and what they're going to do now, which is you know, it's kind of a slight reset, but it shows the importance of, of getting popular messaging out there so that, the, you know, your uncommitted, your non your, your neutrals, your um, are bound into this and people are understanding the point of the doorstep rather than just thinking, well, that's a bit inconvenient, a bit like what Duncan was said about his own journey. I'll just do that because understanding why we should change. I think it's important, but it's absolutely not to um, underestimate a the willingness of, of the ability of small numbers of people to make a, a huge disproportionately loud noise, 
but also pointing to the absolute importance that local authorities in taking decisions should be should do more to make sure that they know what the people at large think, not just what the people who choose to speak on this subject think. Yes. Okay. Yes, and I, I'll add to that representative surveys rather than consultations, which tend to flush out the, the, the people who are engaged with the yeah. process. Yeah. Um, we're just reaching the midnight hour, so to speak. Um, I had one question I was going to put to, to you all. Um, and to some extent, uh, there's certainly been some answers around this, but um, I was wondering that, again, is it a north and south of the border issue, but how, how do we counter the negativity of the mainstream media, which is generally hostile to cycling and rarely deal with the issue of pedestrians? Any, any thoughts on that, Dun Duncan? I'll be very quick. I, I think it's a tireless uh, presentation of basic facts. Um, we had a, an article in the Sunday Telegraph just over a week ago reporting on the increase in bike theft in London LTNs. That came from a piece of research which showed, and this links to Anna's point when she started uh, two hours ago about street violence and, and uh, risks to women. That came from a, a piece of research that Westminster University did showing that street crime in the LTNs had actually decreased. But they fairly pointed out that bike theft had also increased. And the Daily Telegraph chose to report one part of that story on its own without reference to the fact that there was a good news story that actually street crime and violence against women had decreased in the LTNs. And that's just a question of, I think, continually putting that narrative back in a very factual, straight way. Okay. Any final thoughts? I, yeah, I, I'd add to that. It, 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 as well as the fact-based, there is a, there's a broadcasting of the joy of um, cycling and walking. And, and some of the powerful things that I've seen are, are kind of little videos of kids turning up to school walking, scooting, cycling in their droves in a, in a brand new school street. And it is just inspiring to see all the smiling, happy faces. Mm -hmm. That's great, folks. Um, Marshall, Marshall, can I just, Marshall, can I just come in very, very quickly? I'll, I'll be all of 30 seconds and say, yep. I think I totally agree that all of this has to continually be um, rebutted and we have to get the evidence out there, but there's an element that we the media will say what the media will say and we have to just keep going um, mm -hmm. and I think if for example you know we, we see examples where um, it's all the claims that the sky will fall in the high street will collapse everything will be terrible and then the schemes go in and actually life is better afterwards and I think there's an element of we just have to get a lot of this work on the ground and then point to it and say to people but all the things that the media are saying it's not true look it's okay your high street's doing great or isn't this nicer or it's more peaceful um, and they start to see the positivity and I think we just we're, we're, we're nearly there we just need a few more schemes on the ground I think to create that critical mass but there's an element of just having to, to push on through. That's great, Anna. Thanks for that. Um, that seems like a very good point just to, to wrap up. Could I thank all the speakers for their time and contributions this afternoon? We could have gone on for another hour quite quite easily. Um, and apologies to you uh, who haven't uh, had the chance to get their, their questions uh, put forward to the, the, the panel. As I, as I say, there was a quite um, a mountain load of questions there. But thanks to all the speakers uh, and especially thank you to everyone that's attended and to Lander for setting this, this up. Uh, I know it was very well subscribed to and uh, hope you found it interesting, stimulating and we can leave on those positive notes that Councillor Richardson was, was making there. Could I just remind everyone that um, there has been uh, or there will be on-demand recording and slides will be sent to all the delegates and they'll be posted on YouTube and uh, the details will be emailed to, to all the, the delegates. So thanks so much for your time this afternoon and um, safe journeys home, indeed, if you're in the workplace. Uh, thank you.